is the blood. By the way, that was a picture of my Bible. Oh, okay. So Giselle helped me do that. That was, uh, did you see my leg standing down beside it? Yeah, that was, that was my leg. I couldn't get it out of the way. But anyways, today our first, our first message in uh, cheating on Jesus, uh, uh, it's not what you think. We're going to talk about some, some things that as believers, these are fundamental beliefs that we need to understand. The first one is what economy does God operate in? You know what an economy is, right? I mean, we're America, we have an economy, right? And it's up and it's down, right? But it, it basically is the baseline for the way business is conducted in America. Guess what? God has one too, all right? It is basically the baseline for how God deals with things between him and mankind. And so we're going to talk today about how God deals in his economy, and we're going to see from Old Testament to New Testament, from Old Covenant to New Covenant, from Israel to the body to the church, until time evermore, God's economy stays the same. All right? And God's economy is based on the blood. All right? Some people would rather not hear about the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary, but I want you to understand, apart from the blood that Jesus Christ shed on Calvary, there is no forgiveness for sins. So you and, I would, you and I would be eternally lost if it were not for the blood that Jesus Christ shed. So we're going to look at why is that? Why the blood? It sounds bloody, right? And a lot of people would like to weaken that and say, oh, well, it was this sacrament. No, no, it was the blood. It was the blood. And so we want to make sure you understand why it had to be the blood of Jesus Christ. And, you know, so... Part of this is understanding that to cheapen or to lessen the power of the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ is to be cheating on Jesus. All right? So we don't want to do that. Let's take a look at his economy. So I want you, if you can imagine, to set this stage. Now, we've talked before about the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was God's chosen people, uh, not Jews, the nation of Israel. Okay? Okay. Let's always remember in the Old Testament when God is speaking to uh, those in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, you know, where it doesn't matter. God's chosen people. He's speaking to the nation of Israel uh, once they come out of Egypt and they become a nation. Okay. Before that, who was he dealing with? Abraham, right? All right. So we want to talk about this. So we know that in Scripture, God gave the children of Israel instructions to build a tabernacle. Now, this tabernacle was basically a mobile church. Uh, and as he gave them these instructions, he actually was giving them instructions of a mirror image of what existed in heaven. And so he had them build it here on the earth. And in the process of this, they used to do the blood sacrifices. Okay, they'd kill a goat or a bullock or a, or a sheep or turtle doves, depending on what the sin or the offense was or what the celebration was. Remember, we've talked several times. Once a year, they would kill uh, a goat and they would take the blood of that goat and put it on the horns of another goat and release him into the wilderness. Right, which is where we get our term scapegoat. Because Israel would send him off into the wilderness, and he represented Israel's sin being, uh, being uh, covered or removed from their presence. All right? So all of that occurred in this temple or in this tabernacle. So I want you, if you can, imagine that here's this high priest. Now, this high priest has been sacrificing animals after animals year after year after year after year. He's doing the same sacrifices over and over and over and over according to the Levitical and the sacrificial laws in the Old Testament. Well, all of a sudden, one day, he comes running down the hill from the temple high mount and screaming to everybody, Behold, we have the final perfect lamb without blemish, without spot that will take away the sins of the world. Well, what would that mean for the nation of Israel? It means that they'd no longer have to do sacrifices. Had that ever occurred, it did not occur in the Old Testament. Had it ever occurred, they would have no longer had to do these sacrifices in the temple. So we want to set, why is it that there was blood sacrifices in the temple? What well, was commanded of God? Read Leviticus chapter 8, read uh, Exodus, where it, it, God gives instruction to Moses on how to build the tabernacle, to, to do the altars, the, burnt, uh, the altar of burnt offerings, 
All right, there was a set procedure and method in which they had to slaughter these animals and present their blood in the Holy of Holies. Okay, I promise you, stay with me, it's going to become clear to you why it's important about the blood. So speaking of the old covenant, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, now that would be great that they never had to do it again, but that wasn't the case. If you remember when Jesus Christ walked on the earth, what were they still doing in the temple? They were still offering sacrifices. If the temple was there today, what would they be doing? They would still be offering sacrifices because Israel as a nation or the Jewish people as a nation do not believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. So we need to understand that if they actually had a temple today, they literally would still be doing the animal sacrifices. Remember that when Jesus Christ came to earth, he came to who? Israel. He came to reveal himself as the Messiah to the nation of Israel, but they rejected him. Right? What was it when he stood before uh, the, the prelate or the governor and they said, hey, I can release to you Jesus or I can release to you Barabbas who was a convicted murderer? What did they say? Give us Barabbas. And when he asked, well, what is it that I do with this man? They yelled, crucify him, crucify him. My point is, is that they obviously did not see that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. They were stuck, so stuck in their religion, they missed the opportunity for freedom. So we're going to take a look at this. Remember, all in all, we're talking about the blood, okay? So... Speaking of the Old Covenant, Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 2, uh, two, and the subject that it's speaking about is the law. For the law can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, speaking of Israel and what they're doing in the temples, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, in other words, if it could make it perfect, Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness or be aware of sin? What Paul is doing is, is, is he's instructing and telling them that, listen, had they understood while they were offering the sacrifice, had they accepted the Messiah, had they received that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, had they seen that, there would be no need for them to continually offer sacrifices. But the law, if the law could cleanse you, then it would have already been done. Because the law is what dictated what animals they sacrificed and what method they sacrificed them, how they were to be butchered, how they were to be burnt, how they were to be offered. So the law has no answers for freedom. So let's keep going. But this announcement did occur. Remember I told you about the priest come running down the hill making this announcement. Of course, and that didn't happen. Oh, behold, the perfect lamb of God's been found and we're going to be... That didn't happen until the Lord Jesus came. And John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ coming. And as he saw Jesus Christ coming, he said, Behold, <clears throat> the lamb of God who covers the sins of the world. What? That doesn't say covered? What's it say? Takes away. Takes away. I want you to understand something. We're going to talk about this a little more next week. The Old Covenant, do you know why they had to do the sacrifices year after year? It just covered the sin for a year. Just covered it for a time. They were given 12 months. Each 12 months, the nation of Israel would come to the high priest. He would have to go in and offer the offerings into the Holy of Holy, place the blood on the four uh, points of the mercy seat, and then released the scapegoat out into the wilderness, and they were good for their past sins. And they were, they were, it was so real to them that they would stand on the rooftops. The entire nation would stand on the rooftops and scream and yell and holler for joy. But the moment that that scapegoat left, what started over again? the accounting of their sin until the next year. And then they had to do the blood of the bulls and the goats all over again every year, but not with Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ, when John announced, behold the Lamb of God 
who comes to take away the sins of the world. Today, we have a perfect lamb in the person of Jesus Christ, which he sacrificed himself once for all. Man, if we don't get anything today, get this down in your heart. Once for all. This is so important because you know what happens to us as believers. We, we tend to get into this mode where, yes, I understand he died for my sins. Yes, I understand that the blood took away my sins, that I've been forgiven, and that I have eternal life. And, you know, and, and that's all fine up until I get saved. And then I have to start keeping a checklist, right? Or, or until you get saved, then I have to keep an eye on you to make sure you're doing, you know, what's right. Nowhere in Scripture. This verse and many others that we're going to look at say once for all. You need to leave your guilt behind. Let go of the guilt that is holding you back. Let go of the guilt that is preventing you from being free in Christ. Because the blood, the blood sacrifice required by God for the payment of sin was paid once for all through Jesus Christ. And we're going to take a look at that. Hebrews 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood, don't, take the, don't ever let anybody help you remove the blood from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ is why there is a gospel. It had to be the blood. Oh, well, couldn't he have done this or that? No, he had to shed his blood. Remember, he was God in the flesh. Hebrews tells us that he was the very image of God. And he knew that he required a blood payment for sin. So don't ever let somebody help you take the blood out of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without the blood, there would be no freedom. All right? So look at Hebrews 9, verse 14. You know why Paul, I think Paul's the writer, uh, the writer of Hebrews. You know why this is so big when Paul deals with this so... I mean, if you read the books of Hebrews, in fact, for this... Uh, for this journey that we're doing on cheating on Jesus, if you'll read Hebrews 9, 10, and 11, I think you'll be right in the area of where we're going to spend most of our time. Uh, but Paul is really hammering the Hebrews because this is where they're missing it. They're missing it. Some of them are going, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I see that he died for his sins. Um, I, I, I accept that, uh, but right now I have to go offer a turtle dove because we just had a, a girl. They were missing. They were, they, were, they were trying to cling to the truth and mixing the law in diluted or polluted the truth. And we need to understand that when we mix law in with grace, we are diluting the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are diluting the power that we find in the blood of Jesus Christ. And even so, we are polluting our own selves because we are chaining ourselves to something that the Bible has already proven did not work. The law. That's what that first verse 1 and 2 of chapter 10 was saying. If it could have worked, it would have worked. Then they would have quit offering. But they're still, if they had a temple today, they would be offering today. The law, the Bible says, was our tutor until we saw Jesus Christ. Once we saw Jesus Christ, we no longer had a need of the tutor. The Bible tells us that the law came through Moses, but truth and grace through Jesus Christ. Hebrews tells us that if the old had been perfect, then there would have been no need for the second. Had the first covenant been perfect, then there would have been no need for the second. But the first was not perfect. So the second, with power, completed the first. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God? Cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. Do, do you know what that's talking about? That's talking about because you're saved, forget your past. Amen. You understand? That's exactly what he's saying. Yeah. Cleansing your conscience is talking about wiping what you need to understand that under the grace covenant, your sins will be remembered no more. Amen. And because they're remembered no more, this verse is literally saying because Jesus Christ shed his blood and he offered himself as a sacrifice, the last part, cleanse your conscience from dead works 
to serve the living God. I promise you, if you're living in your past, the chances of trying to serve God in joy and love and peace and patience and temperance, self-control is very difficult because you're so stuck in your past. And what happens is, this is why we're talking about the blood. We need to understand that the blood removed it. No, no, not took it and put it in a box over here so that later on when you mess up, because you know you will, well, God's going to pull all of these things out of the box. No, no, the Bible says he remembers them no more. You will never again, if you are born again in the power of the gospel of the grace, you will never again give an account for sin. Amen. It has been judged and the wrath has been paid and dealt out on Jesus Christ by him shedding his blood. Listen, this isn't, I'm yelling at this is a, this should be an encouragement to you. Let go of the things that are holding you back. Let them go. They're no longer on you. Christ Jesus paid for them. Let them go and go forward and live free in the blood and in and, and, and the grace of Jesus Christ. Look what 1 Peter 3.18. We looked at this last week. For Christ also died for sins how many times? For how many? For all. Once for all. The just for the unjust. <laughs> Amen. So that he might bring us to God. Now look at this last part. Having put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Do you know that you are joint heirs with Jesus Christ and that you share the same fate? When he died on Calvary, he was put to death in the flesh. When he resurrected... On resurrection morning, he was alive in the spirit. Do you know that when that happened to him, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, the same thing happened to you. You died in your flesh and were made alive in your spirit to God. No longer are you that person. We've talked about that. Grumpy is dead. Leave him in the grave. Quit trying to put them heart paddles on him and bring him back to life. He couldn't come to life if you wanted him to. You need to understand where do you stand in the Lord Jesus Christ? You stand cleansed, holy, righteous all the time. Oh, Mark, you don't know what I was doing last night. Well, you don't know what I was doing last night. Hey, hey. The truth is, the truth is it doesn't matter. The truth is, is, this is so important. The truth is you are free in Jesus Christ. No matter what you were doing last night, no matter what you're going to do next month, you are free in Christ, if you, are, if you know the truth and the truth will set you free, you'll be free indeed. Let me tell you what the truth is. When Jesus Christ died on Calvary, so did you. When he rose again the third day, so did you. We need to understand who we are in Christ. And we need to understand that the blood applied to us means no more sin forever. It's important for us to rest there. Listen, you want to know why you don't understand what resting in Christ means? Because you don't understand what forgiveness you have. I, and me too, me too. It's the same thing for all of us. We need to understand that our forgiveness is complete. It's done. Oh, here's the thing. A lot of times we forget that Jesus Christ dying on the cross is not a story in the Bible. It is a verifiable historical act recorded by historians throughout time. It is testified to. There was a man named Jesus Christ. And he did hang on a cross. And his tomb is empty to this day. We think it's some story that some nice people tell. And so we're supposed to live right. And we can walk like this. And it's okay. No, it's the truth. He really did die. He really was God. He really did shed his blood. He really was buried. He really did rise again the third day according to the scriptures. And you have really been set free from your sin. The blood for us does not mean the covering of sin. It means the removal of sin. Amen. The issue concerning forgiveness of sins becomes crystal clear if we understand God's economy. God required what for sin? The blood, right? We're going to take a look at how that happened. Here's uh, God's economy has always been the case that, one, uh, br that brings forgiveness of sins, namely the blood, nothing else. <laughs> if we accept God's blood-only economy, it can change our understanding of how we stand before him. Here's the bottom line. 
is that no amount, and this is real important, and we're gonna, the, next, the next slide is going to show you verses where we're going to see throughout history, God's economy has never changed. And it hasn't changed today. You want to know why lost people are dying and go to hell? Because they haven't received the blood sacrifice. Oh, it's already been done. It's been paid. The gift is there. But because they have a choice, they decide whether they accept it or not. But the blood has already been applied. The blood has already removed their sins, but they must receive it. Right? They have to decide that what that, what that means is true for them. And so we need to understand that when we're talking about the blood economy, <laughs> the bottom line is, is that no amount of talking or dialoguing with God, and I think you ought to talk to God, but listen, here's, here's, here's the prayer of a believer that understands his, his position under uh, uh, the, the blood being applied to a believer's life. Here it is. Father, this is what I need. Father, this is, uh, Lord, help me help them. Lord Jesus, thank you for your provision. Lord God, help me to help so-and-so with their provision. God, help us to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. God, help us to continue to do your will. Lord, let us be followers of you. Lord, let us follow after you. Do you hear me saying anything about asking forgiveness for sin? No. Because my sin is forgiven. If I continue to ask for that sin, and, and one, of our, one of our messages will be about confession, okay? We're, we're going to cover that. But listen, if I continue to ask about sin, did the Bible say that he died once for all for the forgiveness of sins? So we have to decide, is that true or not? It really comes down to the individual making a decision whether the Bible is true or not. If the Bible is true and he died for all of mankind's sin once for all time, for all sin, for all human beings, that's either true or it's not. If it's not true, then you might as well get up and leave because this is not, this is, this is, is fake. It's a fallacy. So you have to decide, are you going to believe what he says or not? And no matter the amount of talking and dialoguing with God, asking for forgiveness over and over and over, when, when you receive Jesus Christ, forgiveness was not from only that moment behind but from that moment to eternity forgiveness is implied because the blood was applied okay your forgiveness is eternal i know this isn't a popular message i know i'll probably get heat for it it doesn't matter i'm telling you see, the problem that we have when we talk about forgiveness eternal forgiveness is that Immediately, people jump on the fact, and, and it's a shame that we tie the grace of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, to sin. That's unfortunate. When you, when you say the gospel of grace, people immediately go, oh, well, that preacher means you can go sin and do whatever you want. Have you ever heard that come out of my mouth? Here's the point. The point is, is when you understand grace, that the blood being applied removed your sins forever, past and to eternity. In other words, you live in a state of righteousness and holiness and complete forgiveness right now. Right now, right here on planet Earth. It's not a heavenly thing. It's a here thing. The problem is, is that when people hear you say those things, they're saying, oh, that guy's saying I can just go do whatever. No, what I'm telling you is that when you understand that, when you begin to rest in, in who you are in Christ Jesus and understand what the power of his blood did in your life, what it means for your eternal life, what it can mean for all that you are right now, right here on planet Earth, sin really becomes one of the furthest things from your mind. You know why? Because when you're thinking like that, you're not thinking on the flesh. You're thinking on the spirit and, 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 the, and the spirit of God living and, and, the, and being possessed in you and living through him. You're not concentrating on the things, whatever they are, promise, I promise you, uh, you know, some things that are a sin to me wouldn't be a sin to you. Some things that are a sin to you wouldn't be a sin to me. You know, you stand before God with your own conscience, Amen. not with my conscience. My conscience is the only one that stands before God, and I'll put it this way. As far as sin goes, my conscience is clear because the blood was applied. Amen. And when the blood was applied, my sin was removed. The Bible says Amen. that he will remember them no more. Amen. So we need to understand where we stand, right? 
We want to look at uh, no amount of asking God to forgive us will initiate more. This really is the truth. Hey, it's already been done. It doesn't matter how many more times you ask for forgiveness. If you're a born again believer, you're forgiven. You live in a state of forgiveness. That means that, means that it doesn't matter what you do, you're forgiven. Amen. I, I know people that scares people, but the truth is, is grace is just that big. Yeah. We, we just need to understand that grace is just that big. Jesus is just that good. God loves you just that much. Amen. That you live in a state of forgiveness because of his blood. Right. Not because of what you do or don't do, but because of what he has already, already, past tense, already completed Amen. through the shedding of his blood. God required blood and Jesus Christ gave his blood. Blood sacrifice is the only action which results in the forgiveness and the cleansing. And you can see that in Hebrews 9.22. And according to the law, one may, al uh, may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And look at that last part. Without the shedding of blood, there is no what? There is no forgiveness of sins. The King James says there is no remission. And you know that word remission means removal. Without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of sin. Okay. The Old Testament, we're looking at nothing but the blood. This has always been God's economy. We need to understand this because it's important that we understand how important that blood is to us. That blood's been applied to you and I as believers in Jesus Christ. And that means that because that blood's been applied, our sins are remembered no more. I don't have to wake up tomorrow when I mess up and, and ask for forgiveness. I'm forgiven. I live in a state of forgiveness. And I know that's hard for us to understand because we know how dirty we are. We know who we are, right? And so a lot of times it's hard for us to stand and, and, and live and walk in that state of forgiveness. And we need to because in that state of forgiveness is freedom. Amen. Freedom from your past, freedom from your hurt, freedom from anything, any fear, any confusion. Only rest in the freedom of understanding that the blood has removed your sin forevermore. Forevermore. Amen. Forevermore. Look at Old Testament, Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of both of them were talking about they've, ate, they've already ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it says their eyes were opened and both of them knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings or loin cloths out of fig leaves. Read down a little further in verse 21. The little, now remember the Lord God is looking for Adam, right? What's the first thing he, uh, Adam says? Well, Lord, uh, I, I was hiding because I was naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree? Right? Not because God changed, but because Adam's concept of shame or, un, or un, unashamed changed. And the next thing God tells him <laughs> is, who told you you were naked? And then after he cast them out of the garden, look what the Lord does. The Lord provides them skins. Now what happens with skins? Something died. Yep. Something's blood was shed. Unless you know of some kind of animal that naturally sheds its skin and not a snake. I'm thinking that wouldn't be very helpful, right? No, so God himself, God himself, in order to cover Adam and Eve, he killed animals and provided their skins to Adam and Eve. Blood had to be shed for God's protection. Abraham's covenant. Genesis 15, 9 through 10. So uh, this is Abraham's, um, or God speaking to Abraham. Because uh, Abraham's had this covenant with God. He's still got no children. God's told him he's going to be as numerous as the stars of the sky. And Abraham's like, how do I know that this is so? And so God says, okay, I'll tell you. He says, so he said to him, uh, God speaking to Abraham, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. What do you think he's going to do with them? The blood's going to be shed. Why? Because God's making a covenant. God's economy has always been in the blood. God's economy is dealt with the blood. Even the law of Hammurabi, which is, is what uh, Abraham would have known during this time in history, required that uh, animals be uh, slaughtered in order to seal a covenant. Well, I wonder where they got that from. 
Here we see God doing the very same thing. He's trying to seal a covenant with Abraham because Abraham said, how do I know you're going to do what you say you'll do? So God tells him to bring these animals. And then in verse 10, then he brought all these to him and he cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. Uh, but he did not cut the birds. If you'll read that a little further, you'll see that what happens is when the Lord visits him, uh, the Lord tells Abraham to walk through the middle of them. And the Lord walks through the middle of them. And in the law of Hammurabi, that would have been the sealing of the covenant. It would have been the agreement. It's about the blood being shed. It's always about the blood being shed. The new covenant with believers from, from uh, uh, the law to grace, it's about the blood. We need to understand that. Why do you think in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when we're drinking the Lord's elements, what is the blood rep or what does the wine represent? Amen. This is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant is not associated with the body or the bread. The new covenant is associated with what? The blood. Because God's economy has always been about the blood. Amen. So it had to be his blood that was shed. Uh, Israel, going on further in history, sacrificial laws. You can read in Leviticus chapter 8, uh, Exodus chapter uh, 22 and on as it begins to describe the construction of the tabernacle. Uh, and, and you'll see in there, oh man, when they did the, when they did the, 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 the um, uh, ceremony for the, what do you call it when you, you know, open something, the grand opening, if you will, of the tabernacle, uh, they had animals lined up for miles. And then what, what uh, uh, Moses had to do first was he had to bring Aaron and all his sons in because they had to have priests to observe the, the, the work in the temple. And so Moses had to first go in and he had to sacri uh, sacrifice animals and he had to cleanse the temple. Then he had to go and he had to anoint and sacrifice animals and cleanse Aaron and his sons who were the high priest and the priests. And then Aaron and his sons then could come in and they had to sacrifice animals in order to uh, convey that covenant with the nation of Israel. It has always been about the blood. It has always been about the blood, and it's no different today in this age of grace. All right? Let's keep going. <clears throat> Nothing but the blood because there are no more blood sacrifice. Here's the thing. See, if we remove the blood, and if our... <laughs> this is real important... If our sins aren't truly forgiven if, they're, if, uh, forgiven, if they're not truly removed, and blood is how God does business when he's dealing with sin, what are you doing for the forgiveness of your sins? How many of you, let's see your show of hands, are going out and, and slaughtering animals for their sin sacrifices? Anyone? So what's going on with your sin? Do you see why the Bible either has to be true or it has to be a lie? Because if there's no more blood sacrifices for today... Either Jesus Christ's blood was good for all time or it wasn't. Otherwise, God requires blood to cover sin. How many of us are going out and, and, and sacrificing animals to cover our sin? None of us. This is exactly what Paul is talking about. He says, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can always take, oh, never, yeah, which can never. Do you see that even in the Old Testament when they were doing these and the priests were ministering continually in the office of the priesthood, even then it still never took away the sins. It just, it just covered it for that time period, for that year. Right. So it never took it away. It was never taken away until Jesus Christ came. That's why John's announcement, behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Amen. Very different from what was going on. Do you see why it's a new covenant? Something very different was about to happen. You don't want to know why Israel had struggled in, in, in believing that? Because here they've done this. Religion, right? I was raised a Baptist. I was born a Baptist. My parents are Baptist. My grandparents are Baptist. I'm going to die a Baptist. And after I die, I'm going to live in... Or whatever denomination. Right? Well, guess what? That's exactly what Israel was doing. They couldn't see that God had changed the covenant to freedom yep. and they were living in the old covenant. Yeah, that's and so when he said, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away, remove the sins of the world. Can you imagine what the Jew must have been thinking? What Israel must have been thinking? Who's doing what now? Well, hold on a second. 
I'm supposed to offer a turtle dove if I have a boy and, and 16,000 of them if I have a girl. What, what's changing here all of a sudden? This guy's saying now that this is the Lamb of God and he's not going to cover my sin. He's going to remove my sin. Do you see why they struggled? Because they were so steeped in their tradition. They were so steeped in their religion. They could not see freedom when it stood before them. Yeah, <clears throat> Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, Jesus Christ, all right, they stood daily ministering in the temples. They never sat down. It was forbidden to have a chair in the temple. You know why? Because the work was never done. If you came in and the priest is sitting down in a lazy boy, you'd be going, well, he must not have anything to do. Well, the priest reason for existence was to continually minister before the Lord for the forgiveness of Israel. So there were no chairs in the temple because that work was never done. But look at what happened when Jesus came in. But he, having offering one sacrifice for sins for all times, did what? Sat down at the right hand of God. It's done. You notice that the, the, the last thing that Jesus says on the cross is what? It is done finished. He paid the price. He shed his blood for all of humanity. Every sin that you've ever experienced or will ever experience has been removed by the blood. The blood is important. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart and on their minds. I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I'll keep an account of after they get saved. And then when they screw up, I'm going to beat them for a while and throw them in front of the church so the church can beat them. No. Is that what that says? No, no. no. no, no. It says their sins I will what? Remember no more. I will remember no more. So is God a liar? No. You have to live where he is. Hallelujah. You have to understand that God is not a liar. Remember the whole new covenant. It said that God could find no higher than himself, so he swore to himself. He made an oath to himself about the new covenant. Amen. Removing us from the, from the, from the uh, new covenant. It's all about him. Amen. He decided the blood needed to be shed. He decided that the blood was going to be precious and that it would be spotless. He decided that it would remove sin Hallelujah. and that he would never think on it again. Yes. You live in an eternal state of forgiveness. Amen. I know that's hard for a lot of us to understand because we know ourselves better than anyone else. But it does not change the fact or the power of the blood. Jesus Christ. That was God's economy has always been about the blood. And when Jesus Christ came to earth, he knew the ultimate goal was going to be his blood being shed, him being buried, and him being resurrected. He always knew that the blood would be required because it is the only thing that removes sin. And from then on, you and I, when we receive that truth of Jesus Christ, we are forevermore in a state of forgiveness. You know what that means, a state of forgiveness? It means you live in forgiveness. Now, how much easier is it to get up and go on when you know your own background and you know your own past and you know your own mistakes when you can grab hold of the fact that the blood of Jesus Christ removed your sins so much that God himself says, I won't even think on them anymore. Right? That should be encouraging to you. That should be, that should be uplifting to you to know that you no longer have to rest in your past. It's been forgiven. So it no longer exists in God's eyes. You will not stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and him open the box and go, well, Jess, there's this one time. <laughs> Never again. Jess is born again. He has been forgiven from eternity past to eternity future. Hallelujah. You need to understand how that blood applies to us. Because if we understand the economy of God is about the blood, then we will understand that the blood that was applied to you and I gave us a state of eternal forgiveness. Praise God. You know what? That means you can leave here right now and walk out and never again think on your past and be completely and totally satisfied in God. And I'll tell you what, that, that, ought, to, that ought to give some shouts. Shout, Brooke! Since that's the case, we must conclude something about one-time sacrifice, and we're going to close here. Either it was or it was not enough to bring a lifetime of forgiveness and cleansing. If it was, then God is what? Satisfied. 
You see, that's the importance, right? It's Romans that tells us that the, the, the penalty of sin is death, right? Romans 3.23, the wrath of God is on who? All mankind. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? We hear over and over. So listen, we have to understand, either the blood was enough for God to be satisfied or it wasn't. According to Scripture, God is satisfied through the blood of Jesus Christ. What did he say when John the Baptist baptized his son? He said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hear you him. God was directing all of mankind. Don't worry about John the Baptist. Don't worry about Ezekiel. Don't worry about Isaiah. Don't worry about Moses. This is my son. In him am I well pleased. Hear you him. From that moment on, God changed what we were to pay attention to. Our focus is Jesus and Jesus alone. Let's pray.